I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. President Trump has signed proclamations to formally scale back two sprawling national monuments in Utah, Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante. The president traveled to Salt Lake City to make the announcement and sign those declarations. The move is supported by Utah's top Republican officials, but opposed by tribes and environmental groups. The U.S. Supreme Court will allow enforcement of the Trump administration's travel ban affecting eight countries, six of them with a Muslim majority. Judges are allowing the restrictions to take full effect while the appeals move forward. Those against the ban call it discriminatory and a violation of the U.S. Constitution. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi and Senate Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer hope President Trump keeps an open mind when he meets with them Thursday. The top two Democrats accepted an invitation from the president for a White House budget summit to find ways to avoid a potential government shutdown. Federal money runs out at midnight Friday. The first ever text message was sent 25 years ago this month. A British engineer sent the first SMS from a computer to a mobile phone belonging to then director of Vodafone. It read simply, Merry Christmas. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg. I'm Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, big tech and the tax overhaul. How will Washington's plan for the sector's offshore profits impact Silicon Valley? We'll discuss potential scenarios if the bill becomes law. Plus, Europe's tech VC bonanza. How startups are on pace to collect a record $19 billion from investors. And Xiaomi's potential 2018 IPO. Is $50 billion a realistic target for the Chinese smartphone maker? We'll discuss what could be the biggest tech IPO since Alibaba. But first, to our lead. Early into Saturday morning, after a drama-filled week and last-minute revision, Senate Republicans finally amassed the votes they needed to pass their version of tax reform. And while the bill still has to be reconciled with the House version, we're getting a better read on how this could affect the tech industry. Take a listen. It was a round of applause on Capitol Hill for GOP senators as they passed their version of a tax bill, is passed. pushing the Trump administration closer to its first piece of signature legislation. If they send it to my desk, I promise all of the people in this room, my friends, so many friends in this room, it's a great state, I promise you I will sign it. I promise. I will not veto that bill. Tech companies have spent big to make sure their interests are heard. Big Tech stands to benefit from the legislation in a few ways. First, the latest bill would slash the corporate rate from 35 to 20 percent. Although, according to Goldman Sachs, the tech sector already benefits from a 24 percent effective rate. Then there's the hordes of cash stockpiled overseas. Big Tech stands to benefit with this new tax legislation, which lets them defer taxes on foreign earnings until they bring them back to the U.S. at rates of 7.5 to 14.5 percent, down from the current 35 percent. We get this passed, which I really believe we will. I think we have to as a country. It's going to bring back, I would say, $4 trillion back into this country, which right now cannot come back. In our view, it should be a deemed repatriation. This means it should be a required tax. And so you're not asking the people uh, that have had earnings from their international uh, subsidiaries if they'd like to bring back money. The current bill would make it a voluntary repatriation. Though the question stands whether bringing back this offshore money will go into anything other than buybacks or M&A. Lastly, telecom firms could win big if enhanced deduction for the capital expenditures make it into the final bill, theoretically allowing them to upgrade the fiber backbone of the nation. For now, though, the waiting game goes on until a final bill hits the president's desk. As you just saw, the Trump administration wants tech companies to bring back their overseas stockpiles of cash, in turn keeping companies like Apple from fleeing tax havens like Ireland, where Apple just reached a deal over $15.4 billion in unpaid taxes to pay those back. Bloomberg Gadfly columnist Shira Ovide joins us now. So let's start with the actual rate. It's a lower effective rate, but the effective rate is already fairly low. How much of an impact is this going to have? 
I mean, look, every business wants lower taxes. I think that's been clear in all of the debate about the tax legislation this year, that companies in tech and outside of tech are very happy to have a lower tax rate, even as, as you said, a lot of these companies are not paying the 35% statutory rate because of tax breaks and other reasons. So what about repatriation? How much money is this actually going to bring back? $4 trillion, as Donald Trump says? Yeah, I'm not sure where he got the $4 trillion <laughs> number. I mean, look, there are several trillion dollars of, of companies, uh, company money parked offshore that are considered permanently reinvested and therefore not taxed at 35%. Mm -hmm. But you've seen ways that companies like Apple have de basically done stealth repatriation, right? So Apple has $250 billion or so parked overseas, but they've also borrowed $100 billion in the last few years to do things like buying back their shares, issuing dividends, things like that. And you can look at that as a way to repatriate create money without paying the tax, which is kind of what Apple uh, might be able to do under this proposed legislation. Now, there had been concern about stock option legislation yeah. that was not in the House bill. It was dropped from the Senate bill. So where are we with that? Right. It looks like, I mean, the, it was basically the startup community's worst nightmare that you saw venture capitalists like Fred Wilson from Union Square basically speak out and said, look, there was a version of this both in the Senate and the House bill for a while that looked like it was going to uh, force a uh, start employees to pay taxes on stock options and restricted stock essentially immediately, mm -hmm. even before they were able to sell those shares. Mm -hmm. And that certainly would have put an undue burden on a lot of uh, corporate workers here in Silicon Valley. So what do you make of the deal that Apple has made with Ireland? And they've come to terms on an agreement uh, on the terms of an escrow fund to pay back these taxes that are they say they owe. Look, I mean, th this dispute over uh, Irish taxes with Apple is going to carry on for many, many more months. Mm -hmm. Uh, so basically, if you remember last year, right, the EU antitrust authorities said to Ireland, you've improperly given Apple a tax break that has allowed the company to avoid something like $15 billion worth of taxes over the years, and you have to go get that back, Ireland, from Apple. And there's basically a dispute about what to do with that $15 billion while Apple, Ireland, and the EU fight about that money. So how do you expect this to play out? It's going to be in litigation for a long time. And look, even if Apple has to pay $15 billion, oddly for a company of Apple's scale, it's not such a big burden. All right. Shira Ogade, our Bloomberg Gadfly columnist. Great to have you here in San Francisco. My pleasure. Thanks for stopping by. Meantime, Broadcom is lobbying for a complete revamp of Qualcomm's board to push through its acquisition plans. Broadcom nominated 11 independent directors to the chipmaker's board of directors. The hope is that these people will approve its $105 billion offer. Qualcomm's board originally rejected Broadcom's $70 per share bid. The board members will be nominated at Qualcomm's annual stockholder meeting in March. Coming up, could sports betting expand outside of Vegas? Details on how New Jersey is trying to win the right to legalize wagering within its borders next. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV. Weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Volkswagen is looking to take on the likes of Uber. The world's largest automaker unveiled a six-seater battery-powered minibus to enter the market of app-based ride-hailing and carpooling. The modified van will begin roaming the streets of Hamburg in the second half of next year. Services using these minibuses are expected to replace one million cars across Europe and the U.S. by 2025. Well, there is no doubt that sports betting has become increasingly popular over the years, much in part thanks to fantasy sports and daily online betting platforms like DraftKings and FanDuel. But sports betting doesn't stop there. According to the American Gaming Association, Americans illegally gamble about $150 billion on sports every year. The U.S. Supreme Court just heard an hour of arguments in a case that could open the door to allowing New Jersey and potentially many more states to offer legal sports betting. As of right now, federal laws ban sports wagering in every state but Nevada. The justices indicated they may let New Jersey legalize single game sports gambling. A decision is expected by the end of June. At the latest, joining us now from LA, Mark Locke, Genius Sports CEO, a global leader in official sports data. So Mark, what does this mean? 
So um, it means there's an opportunity for sports to engage uh, proactively with the um, illegal sports, um, to, to tackle the illegal sports betting market, to increase the integrity and protect the sports going forwards. It's a huge opportunity. So, you know, what action do you expect to be taken here? How do you expect this to play out? So, so if if um, if PASPA does get um, overhauled, I mean, so PAS, PASPA is the is, is the um, 1992 act that was put in place to um, make gambling on amateur sports illegal. If it gets overturned, what we will probably see is a state by state regulation and legislation of sports betting. Uh, what that will mean for the sports is that the sports will need to take proactive steps to make sure that the integrity of their games are protected, that there's transparency and that proper regulation is implemented uh, across the U.S. How has sports betting changed in the last several years, specifically with the rise of FanDuel and DraftKings? Yeah, I mean, I think sports betting has evolved over time. I mean, fundamentally, if you think of um, the sports providing the data for sports betting as, as, as being the, the, the fuel, the gasoline um, for the engine that is sports betting, really what we've seen over the last few years is a, is, is a big increase and in explosion in, in the amount of um, sports data available, which people can then use to place wages on um, in various different sports internationally. So, you know, when you talk about the leagues, what do you expect to happen there? Um, I think I think the leagues are going to um, start to embrace and to um, work with the regulators, work with the various um, stakeholders in the sports betting arena to make sure that when the, the legislation does pass, if indeed it does pass, um, that the, it's done in a way that means that the sports are fully protected, but the players and the games continue to have um, full integrity and to make sure that they are um, really positioned well for the um, for the players, for the fans, and for the owners of the sport across uh, across. The the states. The UK and the US do handle these issues differently. Explain uh, the difference. Sure. So, so I mean, United, the United Kingdom has been a, a long-standing uh, place where wagering is legal. I mean, even the Queen is well known to to, 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 to bet on uh, on horse racing once a year. And um, as of uh, because of that, the UK has got a has got almost the gold standard of um, sports betting legislation anywhere in the world. It's it's been doing it for a long time. The United States is different in that the the, um, the, the the sports betting has been outlawed for such a long time. And and really, what the opportunity that the United States has is to look at areas such as the United Kingdom where regulation has been well enforced um, and well, well constructed to make sure that any leg legislation that's put in place or any regulation that's done is done in a way that benefits all parties including the players, the sports and indeed um, all, part, all, 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 uh, all, all of the fans in that sports ecosystem. What about the risks and the skeptics who say this is illegal for a reason? Um, yeah, I, I, th I think that, that you, you mentioned right at the beginning that the American Gaming Association said that um, they, they, they estimate $150 billion a year is wagered illegally. Um, I think the key point here is that, that, that by creating a proper, well-regulated, well-taxed, uh, sports betting environment within the United States that's done hand in hand with all of the stakeholders and the you know, relevant government authorities. What you do is you create a much safer environment where there's transparency and that the um, the sports betting is is as Adam Silver said in an op-ed that he published a few years ago, taken out of the shadows and into the sunlight. And I think that that alone will drive um, illegal sports wagering underground and make it a much safer place for um, players to operate and for fans to make sure that they continue to have the, uh, the, the, the belief and the, and the support of their sports worldwide. Do you think that that $150 billion, though, will increase if it's legalized? And what are the consequences of that? I mean, the $150 billion is, 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 is the estimate of what is bet by American citizens illegally. Um, and, I mean, if you compare that to what is legally bet in Nevada of around $4.5 billion, um, I think it gives a fairly clear idea of the size of the market and the opportunity. And the key, the key point here is by proper, transparent, well thought through regulation, you can capture that uh, th th those wages within a safe environment and make sure that those wages contribute to things like sports integrity, to um, transparency and making sure that the sports are continue to provide a secure and safe place for, um, for both them and their fans to operate in.
All right, Mark Locke, CEO of Genius Sports. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, as negotiations among political leaders over Brexit come up short, we check in on how the tech industry is faring after the Brexit vote. This is Bloomberg. percent of the S&P 500 members Increase the size of its staff in the UK by 50%. The company is hiring 800 employees in London, predominantly in engineering roles. Facebook is under increasing scrutiny from British lawmakers. They're concerned about Russian interference in UK politics via social networks. Meantime, UK and EU officials in Brussels failed to get a much hoped for breakthrough on Brexit. This after a series of twists and turns that saw their tentative deal derailed over the issue of an Irish border. As deadlines and negotiations remain in flux in the region, there is one sign of strength. European startups are on pace to collect a record $19 billion from investors this year. That's according to a report by the London-based venture capital firm Atomico. And Tom Vehmeyer, partner and head of research at Atomico, joins us now from London. So, Tom, um, how does all this last minute Brexit situation impact tech, impact you in the UK? Well, well good afternoon, first of all, and th thanks for having me on. Um, so, look, this is the third year in a row that we've published our State of European Tech report. And really, what we're trying to do is, is use data to kind of tell the story of, of what's happening around the technology industry across Europe. The headline numbers are that we've seen 19 billion invested across the region. You know, what we think is interesting when you look at that number is just two years ago when, when we first took a look at this, we were celebrating the 10, 10 billion mark. It is clear that we do see that macro events, whether it's Brexit on the one hand or things like the election of Macron on the other hand, you know, are, are really sort of having a, an impact in terms of the sentiment both of, of the region's founders and its investors. Do you expect Brexit to have a longer term effect, however? So I think you know, one of the things that, that we see is very interesting in terms of the key trends playing out in Europe's tech industry today is, is what we've called this sort of battle royale for talent. And you know, when we think about what, we, what, what we're seeing in terms of this kind of fight for technology talent, there are three interesting fronts. Um, you know, first of all, the more that we're seeing companies being founded and, and funded across the region, of course, you're getting more and more startups across Europe competing for technology talent. As you just mentioned, we've also seen the, the sort of landing and expanding of major technology giants, particularly from the US into the region, which, which sort of also adds to the, com to the intensity of competition for talent. And then on the third front, um, Europe's corporates are becoming more and more engaged and, and more and more on the hunt for the right kind of tech talent as they're sort of seeking to respond to the transformation that's happening around them. What's interesting is when you think about all three of those key trends, they really play out across borders uh, within Europe. And, and, and some of the data that we've been able to show in the report is, you know, there are some interesting signs about how both inbound technology talent coming into the UK tech industry, as well as on the outbound side in terms of tech talent potentially moving out of the UK is, is being affected, um, you know, by the, the situation that we've seen, uh, you know, around Brexit. Of course, Brexit hasn't happened yet, and it's, it's too early to tell, but, you know, what, what we do see is that that other countries where there are very strong ecosystems around Europe, whether it's Germany, France, or increasingly now, you know, smaller markets such as the Netherlands or Sweden, you know, they're, they're really sort of in this hunt for talent. So the UK remains the largest destination for capital in Europe. Where does it go? So it, it's been very interesting. So, you know, one of the trends that we've seen is that in terms of uh, rounds of all different sizes, whether we're talking about, you know, two to five, five to ten, 20, 10 to 20, and, and even those sort of mega rounds of 50 million plus, we, we've seen an expansion both in terms of um, 
the absolute capital deploys in rounds of those sizes as well as the absolute number of, of deals happening. Where we have seen um, a, a sort of slight decline has been right at the very earliest stages in terms of those rounds at, at naught to two million. And so, you know, there's a, there's a sort of interesting first sign there of per perhaps, you know, a stabilization in line with some of the trends that we've seen uh, all around the world. So, you know, what are you expecting then with the coming year, given the political uncertainty, the economic uncertainty, the global uncertainty? Sure. So, you know, I think one of the interesting findings that we've had is the more that we've seen the building out of the foundations of the tech ecosystem over here, whether that's in terms of how our entrepreneurs are uh, uh, sort of engaging with the idea of entrepreneurship as a whole, whether it's the sort of supporting cast in terms of our, our pool of talent. We have 5.5 million developers here in, in Europe. That's actually a million more than, you ha than, uh, than we see in the US. Or whether it's the, uh, the, the base of investors that exist here, you know, right the way from our, from our angels at the early stages all the way through to, to sort of growth capital and, and actually into the public markets too. What, what we see is that those foundations are, are the strongest that they've ever been. And, and, and what that means is that Europe's tech ecosystem is now increasingly operating on its own independent, and we would say, you know, virtuous cycle where you're really seeing success breed success. And what's interesting now is that what, what we see happening is that, you know, Europe's tech ecosystem is sort of being built in its own image. We're not doing it the Silicon Valley way. We're not doing it the Chinese way, we're, we're really sort of doing it our own European way. And, and there are three things that we think sort of really define that. First of all, what we see is, you know, a tech ecosystem that's really thriving in terms of deep technology expertise. So, you know, specifically around artificial intelligence and, and around blockchain. Secondly, Europe's ecosystem is, is different to what we see everywhere else, simply because of the incredible geographic diversity. And then the third thing is the appetite that you see here from the tech ecosystem around how it collaborates both with corporates on the one hand and then secondly in terms of collaboration with governments who, who we okay. see you know both can play a really strong role in supporting uh, what's happening meantime facebook google amazon snapchat have all announced plans to expand in london since brexit we will keep watching tom vehmeyer atomico head of research uh joining us from london thanks so much Coming up, the biggest bank in the U.S., J.P. Morgan Chase, has snapped up online payment service WePay in order to get a leg up in the competitive industry of digital payments. We will hear from WePay CEO Bill Clarico next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. The U.S. is opposing lessening the bail terms of former Trump campaign chair Paul Manafort. Prosecutors say Manafort co-wrote an editorial with a Russian writer believed to have connections to Russia's intelligence service. The editorial is said to be a violation of a court order not to try the case in the press. Despite multiple allegations of sexual misconduct, President Trump has endorsed Alabama Republican Roy Moore in next week's special election for the U.S. Senate. In a tweet today, Judge Moore said Trump called him to offer his full support and included the message, go get him, Roy. There's still no breakthrough on Brexit. London and Brussels failed to reach an agreement on some of the more contentious issues after U.K. Prime Minister Theresa May met with EU officials today. Despite our best efforts and the significant progress, we and our teams have made over the past days on the three main withdrawal issues, it was not possible to reach a complete agreement today. Talks are expected to resume this week. The Irish border and the role of the European Court of Justice in the UK after Brexit need to be hashed out. The Organization for Islamic Corporate Cooperation says President Trump's possible recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital is, quote, naked aggression against the Muslim and Arab world. The 57-state organization says members should sever ties with any state that transfers its embassy to Jerusalem. Israel captured East Jerusalem in 1967. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is 
is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. here in Washington, 6.30 Tuesday morning in Hong Kong. We are joined by Bloomberg Sophie Kamarudin with a look at the markets. Sophie, good morning to you. Good morning, Alicia. Well, Asian markets may look on warily at the tech route on Wall Street that especially dragged on chip makers. So we do have Asian stocks set to track U.S. equities lower. Plus, Asian investors have several data points on the agenda. Key among them is a private report on China's services sector. And we are cutting down to the RBA's policy decision. Aussie retailers also bear watching with Amazon's official launch down under. Now, with U.S. tax reforms becoming more tangible, flipping the board, we do have the dollar edging higher while the yen is looking fairly steady and gold holding on to losses after being jolted lower on tax optimism. In Hong Kong, I'm Sophie Kamrudin. Up next, more with Bloomberg Technology. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Chipmakers continue to reel as investors seek solace in stocks seen as more likely to benefit from a tax cut. NVIDIA and AMD both dropping over 5% in Monday trading, and two of the major semiconductor indexes felt the pain as well. Our Bloomberg editor-at-large, Corey Johnson, joins us now to break it all down. So, Corey, what is going on here? Well, I think a lot of this might be out of concern uh, that the current tax bill coming out of the Senate preserves the alternative minimum tax. You're thinking alternative minimum tax, what's that got to do with silicon? But semiconductors are the canary in the coal mine for technology spending. It's the, it is the very basic building block of all technology. And this alternative minimum tax as applies to corporations as it currently stands, could eliminate the R&D tax credit, the research and development tax credit, that is probably the favorite corporate provision of all tax code. And so getting rid of that, uh, that tax code and that element of the tax code, the R&D tax credit, uh, could mean less spending on technology and indeed less spending on semiconductors, and it would hit semiconductors first. And this is after a fantastic run, really in the last two years, for semiconductors. This is as, you know, Broadcom is trying to make the biggest tech deal in history happen by buying right. Qualcomm. Would this impact that? Uh, we'll see. We'll see how uh, fixed they are to this deal. You know, the, the fact that uh, Broadcom was willing to go after this deal, whether or not the NXP semiconductor uh, uh, acquisition of Qualcomm takes place, I think it shows that they've got a lot, a lot of elasticity in, in terms of what they're willing to bid to get Qualcomm. It seems like Broadcom just wants to get big at any price, and it would still be attractive to them. You know, I did some, uh, some crunching of numbers uh, before we came on here. It was really interesting to me. If you look at the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, it's been traded for about 24 years, and the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index has only ever once posted gains of better than 30 percent two years in a row. So last year's up 35 percent. It's up about, I'm looking for the day, up 35 uh, percent for the year. Emily, do you want to guess which two years the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index had double digit, about 30 percent or better gains in consecutive years? Go I ahead, have crazy no idea. Guess. Please That's tell cool. me. It's, it's semiconductor trivia. It's important. It's 98.99. So at the very height of the internet dot-com bubble, the Semiconductor Index had about a 32 percent gain followed by a 100 percent gain only to collapse with all the rest of tech stocks. So when I say it's a canary in the coal mine, I really mean that it's something to really to pay attention to when you try to imagine what spending is going to be like for technology companies writ large, not just for semiconductors. It's just, it's a market indicator. It tends to be lagging, but for today, it's a little bit forward looking. All right, good context for us. Thanks so much, our editor at large, Corey Johnson, for breaking that all down. Over the next two weeks, Bloomberg News will be rolling out its series on the future of investing, capturing the convergence of technology and investing. An example of this, J.P. Morgan Chase's purchase of the online payment service WePay. Under the deal, the startup gains millions of Chase's small business customers, and the biggest bank in the U.S. can build out its relationship with startups in Silicon Valley. Here to discuss, we are joined by WePay CEO and co-founder Bill Clarico. So Chase first approached you about a year ago. You know, talk to us about the terms of the deal. What can you share? Yeah, it was actually about a year to the day when we mm. closed was our first visit uh, on site. And it was just a great process of getting to know each other and a shared vision on the market, a shared strategy. And um, we're not really commenting on the, the details of the, the transaction, but we think it was a win for everyone involved. So how does this expand your business and theirs? Yeah, a couple things. I mean, for us, it's, you know, at a high level, it's about combining the technology of a Silicon Valley startup and the technical talent there with the, you know, the scale, the brand, the distribution of one of the world's largest financial institutions. So uh, 
So, right, talk to us then about how this fits into the broader U.S. financial landscape. Sure. So, you know, the payments industry is really being completely disrupted by technology. You know, historically, payments were sold door to door, sort of bricks and, and terminals uh, being sold to restaurants and small businesses. Today, all that's happening through software. And so, banks are having to partner with software companies to distribute payment processing technology. And what WePay does is we make that easy for our software partners to embed WePay into the uh, into those products. How might this help you take on competition like Square, for example? Yeah, so we don't actually even really view Square as a direct competitor. You know, Square also serves small businesses and helps them process payments, um, but really we're enabling other software uh, companies to build Square-like experiences um, and serve small businesses. So we don't really directly compete with them. You know, we're, there are a lot of you know, fascinating tech trends happening right now and very quickly. AI, the rise of AI, uh, the rise of blockchain. How do you expect that to impact the financial industry? Yeah, I think it's still really early days for a lot of these technologies. In our business, we use AI to fight fraud, and that protects our uh, end small business and also lets us deliver an easier sign-up experience with less data. So we're seeing early days, some really great signs and great applications of those technologies, but still early days in, in terms of what's to come. You have said uh, you're in charge with helping JP Morgan State, JP Morgan build out their Silicon Valley presence yep. how how do you ex expect to do that yeah well we're here in this like crazy talent market right and within 20 square miles of where we're sitting there's some of the best technology employers in the world um, and so part of what we're helping do is bring the culture and sort of expertise in hiring top technical talent here in Silicon Valley and helping the bank uh, understand that and really embrace that how do you attract them though when they could work at Google or Facebook or Apple or yeah, for Airbnb. us, I think for us it's about real impact for real small businesses, right? Helping a small business owner get paid faster and take a lot of friction out of their day-to-day -day life, I think is really meaningful and really, in my opinion, more meaningful than, you know, helping optimize some small piece of some ad optimization engine. And so really we sell impact in, in the mission that we're, that we're about. Um, you guys also help process payments for crowdfunding, mm -hmm. you know, which is unique. Mm -hmm. How, where do you see that going? Yeah, so crowdfunding is one of the first sort of technology verticals that we started to play in. And we really had to build our technology to make it super easy because there it wasn't even a small business owner, it was a consumer trying to accept payments. Um, and so we built a lot of our technology to make it super simple for everyday people to use. Uh, and now have been applying that in bigger and bigger small businesses. We think, you know, it'll continue to be an interesting market for years to come. We talked about blockchain earlier. What about Bitcoin? I mean, you know, every day we're sort of <laughs> debating the hype, uh, the skepticism around it, the, the, you know, what impact will it have? Is is it a bubble? Is it a fraud? Which one is it? Yeah. What do you think? I think when you talk to small business owners, really, they're thinking about how do they perform great services and sell great products to their customers and get paid quickly and easily. And the credit card system is a great system uh, for that. Uh, I think as we think about Bitcoin and the future of sort of digital payments, hopefully there'll be ways to speed that up, to take costs out of the system. I'm not sure Bitcoin is the tool for small businesses just yet, but uh, certainly lots of interesting things happening in that space. Um, you know, when it comes to you know, the tax reform that, that we've been talking about, what impact will that have on your business? Yeah, it's still, I mean, it changes by the second. So I'm sure since we've been sitting here, there's been uh, some updates. Um, you know, I, I think anything, you know, we really ultimately, if small businesses thrive and succeed, uh, that'll be good for us. I think it's still early, too early to tell exactly what, how this legislation will impact that. Though. Okay. Bill Clarico, CEO of WePay. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for having for joining me. us here on the show. All right, in other deal news, 21st Century Fox is said to favor Disney as a buyer for some of its assets. According to people familiar, Fox believes Disney is the best strategic fit and presents few regulatory hurdles. The Murdoch family is holding talks with Disney as well as Comcast about combining certain media business. Shares of both companies jumped on the news in Monday's trading session. And coming up, the CME is debuting Bitcoin contracts on December 18th, and more exchanges are looking to follow the move. Why the Gibraltar Stock Exchange says it's the right place for ICOs. Next, this is Bloomberg. Facebook is looking at younger consumers. Its new messenger app for children has no minimum age but gives parents full control over contact lists. The move allows it to compete with Snap's disappearing photo and chat app. The Messenger Kids app will not have ads. 
Bitcoin has some traders thinking what goes up must come down. Hedge funds are planning to strategize against the cryptocurrency when futures become available. According to some trading firms, such as Flight VC, Bitcoin is, quote, one of the greatest shorting opportunities ever. The CME is debuting contracts on December 18th, and the NASDAQ plans on offering futures next year. Another exchange looking to cover the blockchain industry, the GSX, also known as the Gibraltar Stock Exchange. GSX Managing Director Nick Cowan has been on the road promoting this news and meeting with blockchain technology firms in Japan, Singapore, San Francisco, heads to New York later this week. Nick joins me here in the studio now. So how will this work? We're taking everything that we understand about running a traditional stock exchange and applying it to a space where currently there are no rules. So we've seen a huge explosion in token generation events, ICOs, whatever you want to call them. $3 billion raised this year. It seems to be a great way for startups and fintechs to actually access funds. But currently there's no legislation anywhere and no rules anywhere, um, although that we think that's set to change pretty soon as you go into 18. So what we've come up with, we've said, okay, let's open an exchange called the Gibraltar Blockchain Exchange. It's a subsidiary of the Gibraltar Stock Exchange. And let's take all of the stuff that we understand about investor protection, reputational risk, and try to apply some of those to this, uh, this nascent technology, this nascent space. So for example, what keeps us awake? Investor protection. So we want to, uh, first of all, ensure that ICO issuers know where they can go, in theory, to get their trusted network and token sale away. So if you come to our exchange, the first thing you're going to have is a sponsor network. Um, sponsors are approved by our exchange and sponsors, if you think about traditional investment banks, sponsors will help you, the issuer, effectively take your token to market. So we've come up with a set of sponsors rules which define who can, who can and can't be a sponsor. And also as a token issuer, what have you got to comply with in terms of disclosure, transparency, due diligence, what has to go in your white paper, everything that we believe currently is missing from this space. So contracts are about to be traded on CME, CBOE, NASDAQ. How do you expect this to play out? I think it's a sign that markets are maturing. I think it's what, what th this sector needs. I think uh, if you look at what's happened with the CME, et cetera, with what they're doing, they're taking Bitcoin and effectively making it more available to the traditional traders where actually you can, you can start to short contracts. I think in terms of the token sale business, um, that is going to go through a similar process in terms of maturity over the next two to three years. I think at the moment, it's still very early on in the cycle. But if you look at your traditional institutional investors, they can't actually, or they're struggling to get access to invest in tokens um, because it's not a, a security as such where uh, tr your traditional asset class. So again, what we're saying is, look, if you come to our exchange, Token sale issuers will have gone through a vetting process based around best practices of disclosure and transparency and also reporting obligations in the secondary market. And you can launch your token and also be guaranteed a listing on our cryptocurrency exchange. So we think it's unique because it's a token sale platform and a cryptocurrency exchange It's actually managed by a stock exchange and that's the first in the world. Talk to us about the differences in how in the rules around ICOs and the rules around stocks. Well, the rules around stocks, we're in the EU, Gibraltar's in the EU, so for us it's extremely prescriptive. The rules are very clear, we're governed by a bunch of directives based around you know, admissions and transparency and the prospectus directive and market abuse, etc. You look at token sales, there are no rules. Um, so if you're a, an issuer or you're an investor or taking the token, how do you know that what you're actually taking is a utility, not a security? How do you know that what you're taking is run, the business is run by guys who have been vetted as being fit and proper? How do you know that the company itself has a technology um, that actually it's saying in the white paper. So what we've had to do is to take all of that rule-based system that we understand and try to put that in place to come up with a set of uh, guidelines and rules for our ICO space. So, you know, when it comes to the skepticism around Bitcoin, I just asked our guest earlier, you know, there are some people who think it's a fraud, some people who think it's a bubble. Um, and these are very powerful people in the financial industry who have a lot of doubts about the future of, of Bitcoin and even blockchain. Yeah, I think, look, we've, we live in a jurisdiction where we have a pretty forward-thinking government and a pretty forward-thinking regulator. So what we've actually said instead is we believe the blockchain is here to stay. So distributed ledger technology, we believe, is actually going to be part of our lives as we move forward. So in fact, what we've said is in January 18, we're going to be the first jurisdiction, we believe globally, to come up with a regulatory framework for any business in financial services that uses distributed ledger technology or DLT or the blockchain. You can come to Gibraltar, you can get licensed, and you can get regulated by a financial services regulator 
And that does what? It provides regulatory certainty and it provides consumer confidence. But at the same time, having a principles-based system gives you a framework where you can be flexible and adapt to the technology that's going to evolve over the next few years. So how, how, how does Brexit, you know, and especially the last-ditch failed efforts here, impact today. what you're trying to do? Well, I think in many ways a lot of the thinking behind what we were, what we're implementing in January, I think Brexit provided a catalyst. Um, I don't know if people in the States know, but 95% of Gibraltarians voted to remain in the EU. So when the UK voted to leave, we obviously had to leave with, with the UK. So that was a bit of a, a shock to us. What we've tried to do with the DLT regulations and really positioning Gibraltar as a, as a fintech hub is also future-proofing us, future-proofing our future against us leaving the EU. So there is no doubt that uh, leaving the EU was not part of the plan. But funny enough, if you actually look at Gibraltar, being in the EU means you can passport for natural services across Europe. In fact, post-Brexit, we did an analysis and 90% of our passporting is actually into the UK, not into the EU at all. So actually we think by future-proofing ourselves with these new regulations and putting Gibraltar really on the map in terms of being a fintech hub, um, I think we'll mitigate a lot of the challenges that we have once we're outside the EU. All right. Nick Cowan, Gibraltar Stock Exchange. Fascinating to see what you guys are working on. Thank Thanks you very for much. stopping by. Thanks for having me. Coming up, Xiaomi set its sights on a 2018 IPO. Why the smartphone maker is looking to a public market debut. This is Bloomberg. Apple CEO Tim Cook and Google's top executive Sundar Pichai spoke at a state-run internet conference in China. The event marks Silicon Valley's latest attempt to curry favor with regulators. The two highlighted the importance of maintaining an open internet and how much their firms have helped local companies. Apple CEO has so many reasons to stay in the Chinese government's good graces. China is Apple's third largest market and has accounted for roughly 20% of its revenue in 2017. The iPhone maker is facing tough competition from local smartphone vendors, including Huawei, Oppo, and Vivo. Speaking of Xiaomi, the Chinese smartphone maker is seeking a valuation of at least $50 billion in an IPO. According to people familiar with the matter, Xiaomi is considering going public as soon as next year. Banks have suggested Hong Kong as the most likely place for shares to be listed. So why is the startup looking at a public offering? Joining us now, Bloomberg Selena Wang here in the studio. What do you make of it? So it's a good time for them to IPO. They're finally regaining momentum after a really rough last year where they dropped to number five in their local market. Why uh, did that happen? So Oppo and Vivo, these are the newcomers, they really capitalized on the rural areas of China uh, where there wasn't a lot of penetration. And the rest of the China has really saturated uh, in smartphone penetration. So that's what they took advantage of. Now, this is a great time for Xiaomi because now they're finally seeing a turnaround and Leijun is really trying to change the strategy of the company. They're investing very heavily in offline retail and this new retail strategy, as well as international expansion. So they want to get those billions of dollars that they'll raise from the IPO to accelerate expansion in emerging markets, especially India, which they plan on doubling down in, um, as well as other emerging markets, and Spain recently. So, IP, uh, you know, Xiaomi's IPO has been reportedly coming for some time. You know, it's always a question that we ask the executives when we talk to them. You know, do we know if they had some false starts? Do we know if they expect it to go sooner? Um, and why now? Now is a good time, as I said earlier, because this is when they have the momentum, they have the excitement of uh, the investment community while sales are growing rapidly still. Um, that being said, there's going to be a lot of investor skepticism. Now, this is a company that sells their products at razor thin margins. They do that in hopes of getting the rest of their revenue from uh, m rest of their profits from their software ecosystem. And they've created all of these new products from a smart rice cooker, smart scooters, fitness bands uh, to create this ecosystem ecosystem, but they haven't yet created the same thing that an Apple or Google has. There isn't a reason for users to keep on coming back to Xiaomi and be really staying loyal to that brand. So they still have to prove out that strategy at the same time that they're running against these razor thin margins without a lot of room to keep on expanding there. And also 
they're trying to expand globally. What is the latest on their global expansion plans? So India, they just reached a billion dollars in Indian revenue last year, and they want to double down investment there. Other emerging markets are looking at are Indonesia, Russia. They recently launched in Spain. So they have a pretty interesting global expansion strategy. When they look at markets, they want to see where they already have Xiaomi fan bases. Now, this is a company that grew very rapidly through word, word of mouth marketing, through social media marketing. So they saw in Spain, we already have a huge social media fan community. Why not expand there? And in a lot of these local markets, they'll find local e-commerce partners to work with. So for instance, when in China, they not only have their own uh, Xiaomi website, but they also work with Alibaba um, as well as JD.com to sell. And in India, they are also working with local partners like Flipkart and Amazon so that they have multiple ways for consumers to buy their goods. All right. Well, I know you will keep us posted on the road to IPO. Selena Wang, Bloomberg Tech, thanks so much for that report. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. A reminder, we are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That is all for now. This is Bloomberg.